Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video today, we're going to be talking about malignant hyperthermia. So if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment down below, and don't forget to subscribe. And then check out NinjaNerd.org. That's where we have all of our notes and illustrations for every lecture that we put up here on YouTube. We really hope it helps you guys out, and let's get into it. So when we talk about malignant hyperthermia, we're talking about this hypermetabolic condition where our body is going to be thrown into this hypermetabolic condition that is life-threatening because of a medication that we can give during anesthesia. So you're commonly going to see this in some type of anesthesia setting. Now there is other outliers where this can occur in other ways, but the most common way is medication. And it's usually a general anesthetic like halothane or our paralytic or succinylcholine. So if we have a patient that's gone into surgery or is going to get surgery, you want to start thinking about questions like, have you had surgery before? Have you had any problems with anesthesia? Does anybody in your family have trouble with anesthesia? Because these are the questions because malignant hyperthermia does have a genetic link and it does also occur to somebody once they have this problem, we have to think of alternative routes or find the cause that would lead to this malignant hyperthermia. So when we're talking about this, we want to start thinking about first, what is the cause? So I have this little drawing right here for you. So we have our sarcoplasmic reticulum here. We have our, our uh, muscle right here, okay, skeletal muscle. And what we're looking at here is a ryanodine receptor, okay? So this is called the ryanodine receptor. And the job of our ryanodine receptor is to sense calcium that is in and oh, it becomes open. There's an active site that becomes, it activates it. So when this is able to open, it opens up and allows calcium to come into our muscle and then eventually our muscle is able to contract, right? Because we know calcium causes a contraction. So the ryanodine receptor will open, it will allow calcium to pass through and then we can have a muscle contraction. So that's great. But in malignant hyperthermia, we have an issue or a mutation, right? So this ryanodine receptor, it's also commonly abbreviated as the RYR1. This receptor can have a mutation. So when there is this mutation, and we give these medications, the mutation that occurs is that this ryanodine receptor is activated to the point where it cannot close. So now that it is open, right, we're gonna have an influx of even more calcium. So all this calcium is gonna show up in our muscle. And normally, some calcium is good, so we have a contraction, we can have a movement. But when we have too much calcium, so we have an influx of calcium, within the muscle, we are getting a contraction. And that contraction is actually very prolonged. So now this prolonged contraction is occurring and these muscles are going rigid, basically. They're not gonna be able to do any type of movement. It looks very rigid, it looks very tremorous. Because of this, this is now going to cause a increased consumption of oxygen. So these muscles now are causing and want this all this oxygen. So because of that prolonged contraction, we'll say prolonged contraction, it's going to increase our O2 demand. And therefore, we're gonna have an increase in CO2. And that's a problem because what happens with our patients when this occurs is they're gonna have a lot of signs and symptoms that are going on, their heart rate's gonna shoot up, they're gonna be really hot, and all of this is gonna be causing an issue with our patient to be able to blow off our CO2 so they can become metabolic acidosis. And we know that metabolic acidosis is not a good thing for our patients. We see that a lot with patients that are in DKA, and what we want to think about here is how can we reverse this quickly? Because we gave a medication that caused this reaction. Now, how can we help this patient out? Because again, it is life-threatening. If this does not get reversed, we can have a, a serious issue with our patient. So what do we need to administer? The biggest thing is dantrolene. And on the NCLEX, they're going to ask, if you have a patient all of a sudden that's you know in anesthesia, and all of a sudden they're becoming rigid or their temperature shoots up really, really high to like 105, 106. What are some of your things that you're gonna to wanna to be doing? And one of the main things we wanna administer is dantrolene. So let's talk about those signs and symptoms and what are the other interventions that we're gonna be giving to our patients. So now we have a patient that we think is maybe having a malignant hyperthermia reaction and we wanna start thinking about what are we gonna do or what's that gonna look like so we can start telling the team and alerting people as to what's going on. Because again, this is life-threatening. 
So now we have that mutation where our ryodine receptor is not going to be able to close, so it's open. We get that influx of calcium. And because of all that, we start seeing signs and symptoms. And initially, some of the initial signs and symptoms, the first one is going to be the tachycardia. So we have tachycardia, right? Our heart rate starts to shoot up. The patient is going to experience maybe an increase in the heart rate along with some rigidity. So when we talked about before the muscle contraction occurring because of the influx of calcium. So when we have, say, a procedure going on, the doctor might be asking, oh, um, is the patient moving for you? Are they sedated? What's going on? Because they're going to start noticing maybe a little bit skeletal rigidity, rigidity in their muscles. Um, so those skeletal muscles now are activating a little bit, they're contracting a little bit, and we're gonna see some, an increase in tachycardia. So this is where we're starting to say, hmm, I think something's going on with our patient. Along with that, then we're gonna maybe see, this is a little later, but it's still something that we could start seeing, is a little cyanosis and tachypnea, which is our increase in our rate of breathing. We might be breathing over the vent a little bit. And all this has in common one main purpose. We talked about this prolonged contraction with that increase in oxygen consumption. So when in our body, you wanna think when we are increasing our oxygen cons consumption, what is then the waste product of our oxygen? And that is our CO2. So that increase in CO2 is the cause for a lot of these signs and symptoms. So this is all happening because we're trying to blow off or get out that CO2, okay. With that being said, the early signs or things that we're thinking, uh-oh, something's going on. When this occurs, the late signs then will also come, and that's when we're like, okay, this is definitely, this, something's definitely happening here. And there's two really important ones that I wanna touch on. The one, coming from the name malignant hyperthermia, the patient's temp is gonna be greater than 104, or it could be climbing really quickly. Say you had a patient that you started a procedure with and the temp was maybe only 98, 99, and now all of a sudden it's climbing up to 102, 103, and within a matter of minutes. So you're gonna think, okay, something's going on, and we know this isn't good, because if this patient were not sedated, we know that an increase in temperature within the body is causing uh, denaturing of proteins, it's causing issues then eventually cognitively, and our, we're gonna have trouble with our bodily, um, control, right? We're going to maybe urinate, we're going to have some other issues going on. So late sign, one of them is the hyperthermia, and the other one is going to be this EKG right here. You see this spiked T wave here? What does a spiked T wave indicate? Do you remember? It's an indic indication of hyperkalemia, right? An increase in our potassium. And why is that occurring? Again, our patient is in a metabolically acidotic state, so we're gonna have a lot of issues with our potassium increasing because of that breakdown of the muscle. So remember, we have that high oxygen consumption due to that prolonged contraction. That prolonged contraction is also gonna be causing our muscle breakdown or rhabdomyolysis. Then that rhabdo is gonna be causing that increase in our potassium within our body, which is not great as well. So now we have all these issues going on. And these happen relatively quickly. Now remember the later signs, especially the increased potassium, takes a little time to develop. But these are all the signs that we're going to be looking for if we're taking an NCLEX test and they're saying, oh, this happened during surgery, their temperature kind of went up, they're looking a little rigid, rigid, their heart rate was up. Then we got some lab work back and their potassium was high. And these are all signs that we should be thinking in our head, okay, this sounds like the test is trying to make me think of malignant hyperthermia. And when we go to that, we're going to start thinking of our in interventions, right? What are we going to do as the nurse? What can we do as a team member in this situation? Because typically this will happen in, again, some type of surgical setting or procedural setting. So initially, when we have this happening, we want to make sure we're notifying for help. We're either telling the doctor of our suspicion, we're telling the anesthesia, uh, anesthesiologist of this, we're telling our team, maybe we have our charge nurse on call, we can say, hey, I think we're having a malignant hyperthermia um, reaction in here and we want to stop the trigger so if there is some type of medication that's infusing we can stop that. We also want to notify for help sometimes they have an MH cart that we can get to the bedside very quickly so we're able to mix up our medications that we're going to be able to give very quickly. So the main one again is that dantrolene. We want to give the dantrolene and why? Why is the dantrolene important? Well remember we talked about that receptor that we had earlier I drew it backwards, let me draw it the way we have it over there. So we have that ryanidine receptor, right, that's been now, let's say it's open, right? So all of that calcium is influxing in. 
So now all that calcium is going to be flowing through. So what does dantrolene do? Dantrolene just comes in and blocks this so that we don't have that calcium influxing in. So now we've turned off the calcium, which is great so far, but we have some other issues we need to correct as well. We need to apply the cooling blanket to bring down that temperature because we know that hyperthermia is not good. We want to give sodium bicarbonate to offset that metabolic acidosis. And then we also want to maybe treat the hyperkalemia while that comes around. We want to make sure we are treating our patient, getting that potassium back down, because we know that hyperkalemia can re to lead to dysrhythmias and other issues with our patient. So overall, malignant hyperthermia is a very um, straightforward-ish type of um, treatment that we need to give to our patient. We want to think of dantrolene, we want to cool the patient, we want to do the bicar sodium bicarbonate, and then get treat the hyperkalemia as needed. So with that being said, that is the end of the malignant hyperthermia lecture. I hope you guys like this, and as always, until next time.